Mona and I actually met when we worked together in the White House during the Clinton administration. We worked in the National Security Council together. That was a time of great optimism. In the year 2000, the United States was soaring high. We really had no deficits left. People loved us everywhere. We had great relationships with all of the major powers. Things were really headed in a great trajectory. What's happened in the last 10 years is the stunning rise of powers like China and India. Mona and I found that there was a lot of anxiety about the rise of India and the rise of China in particular, and that there was a group of policymakers in Washington that were bent on characterizing China as the next big enemy, um, like the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. We knew we couldn't go down the same Cold War path because we're in a completely different world now. Um, but we didn't know what the right strategy toward these pivotal powers was for the United States. Nina and I felt very strongly that somebody needs to start talking about what does their rise really mean for long-term U.S. prosperity and stability. One of the reasons I think that this book is important now is that we're at this unique moment in history where all the world's biggest powers share these common goals of stability and open markets. And we share common threats of terrorism, climate change, of nuclear proliferation, of contagious disease. In our book, we outline an approach that we term strategic collaboration. And that really is a pragmatic way of engaging the, pow the major powers on policy issues where there's a shared agenda. We absolutely have to work together if we're going to try to thwart terrorist attacks or contain disease or stop nuclear proliferation, that no one country can do that. The main message of our book is that the rise of powers like India, China, Russia, the EU, and Japan is good for the United States. It's a net plus. These powers actually help us in very concrete ways. It's not abstract. China allows our inspectors in their ports to screen shipping containers for nuclear material before those containers reach the United States. India has been tracking Islamic extremist groups for decades, and we now badly need their expertise because some of these groups are now targeting America. Russia is co-leading with us a, a group of 50 nations that are looking at ways to stop uh, the spread of nuclear technology from getting into the hands of terrorists. Japan we're all looking to as a, as a leader in terms of climate change and, and uh, fuel efficiency. We in America have this deeply ingrained sense that if China or India is gaining, that we must be losing that if China or India is getting uh, stronger or richer, that we must be getting weaker or poorer. But it's just not the case. In fact, their economic rise helps our economy. And as they grow, they will buy even more American goods and services. Their growth helps stabilize our economy and keep it growing in the right direction. The fact is that America has to fix some of its own problems at home in order to thrive in this new era of multiple strong powers. We need to deal with all of these problems so that America at home can educate its citizens, can employ them productively, can encourage the innovation society that has fueled our economy for the last hundred years and can continue to do so well into the future. As long as we step up to the plate and we get comfortable with competition and change, we'll be fine. There's going to be new political leadership in the United States. There's new leadership in Japan, there's going to be new leadership in Russia, and now is a perfect opportunity to bring these big powers together. If the U.S. leads and the pivotal powers are engaged, we can make real progress on the world's most pressing challenges.